Vielen Dank, Judith de Haan, Professor Dr. Müller, uh, friends. It's a, it's a great pleasure uh, for me to be here uh, and to be giving a lecture in the name of uh, so distinguished a uh, doctor of economics as Rosa Luxemburg. Um, the modern history of the country that I want to discuss with you this evening uh, is intertwined with the lives of PhDs in economics. Uh, going back to the middle of the last century, uh, Andreas Papandreou, uh, the prime minister who uh, brought Greece into um, uh, the uh, modern state of social development so far as it achieved it, earned his PhD in economics at Harvard University in the 1940s and went on to be chairman of the Department of Economics at the University of California at Berkeley in the 1950s, a university that I did not reach until 1969. Um, when the Andre, uh, Andreas Papandreou returned to Greece in the late 50s and uh, entered a political career uh, and was arrested uh, when the colonels took power in April of 1967, he was saved from execution uh, by the intervention of colleagues uh, in the economics profession in the United States, uh, including uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson's national security advisor, Walt Rostow, but most particularly my father. Uh, and uh, it was uh, the words of, of uh, President Lyndon Johnson and his instructions, uh, his orders to the colonels at that moment that uh, spared Andreas's life. Uh, which makes it, I think, interesting and ironic that when um, that uh, the next, I think, truly significant PhD in economics to intervene in Greek politics uh, was uh, my friend Yanis Varoufakis, an erratic Marxist uh, <laughs> whom uh, I first met uh, because I started going to Greece to provide uh, aid and comfort uh, to Andreas' son, George Papandreou, uh, when he became prime minister in 2010, uh, got to know Varoufakis in 2011, at which point it seemed like a very good idea to bring him uh, to the United States and specifically to the University of Texas, where he arrived at 2013 to teach at the Leonard Dan Johnson School of Public Affairs. So you can see that the strands here are braided together in a very uh, intricate way. Um, and I suppose the, uh, the, the final strand in the braid is uh, yours truly, as you, uh, a, eventually a doctor of economics from Yale University. Uh, and I was, of course, the person who, who brought Giannis to Texas uh, from which he resigned, which teaching position he resigned in January of this year to return to Greece and to um, seek election to the parliament. Uh, election occurred on the 25th of January. On the 26th of January, he was designated uh, to be Minister of Finance, and I received an email that said, get here as soon as you can. Uh, so I arrived in Athens on the 8th of February, uh, and went directly to the finance minister. It was the evening that the uh, prime minister, Alexis Tsipras, gave his opening speech uh, for the Greek parliament, so I was able to go over and listen to that. When I arrived at the uh, finance ministry, and I found my friend in Scots in his office. Uh, there was very little, by the way, of staff equipment or documents, in fact, nothing by the way of documents in the office, but there was an icon that someone had left that was uh, probably a good thing that it was there. Um, and Giannis looked at me and said, welcome to the poison chalice. Uh, so what I want to talk about this evening is the uh, uh, the experience uh, that uh, 
the Greek Republic and the Greek people lived through uh, over the course of this year. Uh, and I'll do so from a certain remove. I left Athens on the 7th of July, the day after Yanis Varoufakis res resigned as Prime Minister. I had not been there in the intervening five months all that much, but I had been engaged uh, uh, from remote locations on a practically daily basis. Uh, and so I think I can uh, share with you uh, in some detail uh, a perspective on what uh, transpired in the relationship between Greece and her creditors, the European and international partners, so to speak, uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, the implications that that may have now for uh, the future of Europe. Just to set the scene, uh, I encountered a book a couple of weeks ago, actually, uh, written by an American journalist by the name of James Angelos, who happens to live in Berlin. It formerly was a Wall Street Journal. It's called The Full Catastrophe. And in that book, Angelos require, uh, recounts travels in Greece over the last four or five years, including to the uh, island of Zekintos in the Ionian Sea, where a prefect and an ophthalmologist uh, sold blindness benefits to hundreds of residents who were not actually blind, uh, to a town in Thrace where the mayor was murdered by two town treasurers, one civil servant murdered by two others, um, which is really not a very good thing for orderly public administration as a general rule, uh, and where, as Angelus tells the story, uh, the two murderers were, of course, arrested, tried, convicted, but they continued to serve on the public payroll uh, at half time uh, for months after, the, uh, uh, after they were imprisoned and no longer actually uh, performing their public functions. Uh, there are many such stories uh, in the book. Uh, not very many people who emerged from it with a uh, uh, let's say, glittering reputation for public probity, uh, and these stories are, of course, generally true. The, uh, but that Greece is a country which is badly run, with inefficiency, corruption, tax evasion, and oligarchs complete, isn't exactly news. Uh, it is a country which has been in default on its sovereign obligations, for roughly half of its independent existence since the 1830s. It has never had a powerful industry, modern civil service, efficient tax administration, or for that matter, a strong welfare state, despite uh, the constructive efforts of Andreas Papandreou in the 1980s. Uh, it has had far more uh, than its fair share of war, civil war, occupation, dictatorship, and betrayals. Further, uh, it's also fair to say that Greece entered the Eurozone under false premises, having disguised its fiscal position, uh, and then took advantage of the convergence of interest rates that followed the creation of the Euro, uh, and of an international investor class that were reaching for even modest increments of yield, in order to fund a vast wave of, uh, in, of military purchases, infrastructure, construction, the Olympic Games, games, and to conceal ongoing deficits in healthcare and other services. In other words, uh, to engage in economic activities which stood no chance whatever of being uh, generating revenues that would permit those debts to be serviced on commercial terms. Uh, so, unquestionably, also many of the loans that were extended involved uh, payment of major kickbacks and a large class of uh, private uh, individuals with public connections were able to enrich themselves uh, from the flow of funds into the Greek Republic uh, in the first seven years or so, eight years, nine years of the uh, European Monetary Union. It is, in short, a history of mismanagement, corruption, and underpinning a massive public debt, which became, of course, much more massive uh, when the financial crisis hit in 2009 and 2010. It's equally, I think, fair to say that the government that took office on January 26th was, in point of fact, unprepared. 
to govern or to negotiate effectively with its European partners. Uh, it was a government uh, coalition of the parties of the radical left, comprised of uh, political activists, trade union leaders, eco ecological activists, and expatriate college professors, the kind of people that one might expect to find in a room like this, uh, but not the sort of people that one would normally entrust to the government or the respectable European state to. Uh, and it was a government that uh, was given very little transitional assistance by its predecessor, in fact, less than nothing. And when I arrived on the uh, uh, 8th of February, I discovered that the, uh, that the uh, wireless service of the finance ministry had not quite been set up, and it was functioning the next day. The staff consisted of two secretaries, a pro bono team that had flown in from Lazare Frères in Paris, the Minister of Finance, and one unpaid volunteer from Texas, namely myself. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, previous group of highly paid consultants were, had been dismissed, and they were feather bedding, and, and all the documents and equipment had been removed. Uh, so that was, in fact, uh, uh, starting from a tabula rasa. Uh, what happened, uh, we went up to Brussels on the mm, 11th or 12th of February uh, in uh, the rather decrepit government on uh, with the entire government, in fact, the Prime Minister uh, on down, uh, to begin the process of negotiations during which uh, foreigners, such as myself, were assisting in however we could, including typing documents in the back rooms as the, uh, uh, as the Eurogroup meeting was proceeding, uh, both in Athens and in Brussels. There was one extraordinary, exceptional, tireless, and eloquent academic uh, who set policy uh, and for, at first uh, directed the negotiations, and that was my friend Yanis uh, Fakis. Uh, over time, uh, divisions in the government emerged uh, between the finance ministry and the prime minister's office, which were not effectively concealed and not effectively managed. International media relations, and particularly, I have to say, that the German media were not exactly a uh, sterling success. The government was not corrupt. Uh, but, of course, at the lower levels of public administration, it's very hard to change things quickly immediately. Uh, so that's as roughly, I think, as bleak a portrait as I can accurately uh, sketch for you. And the question I would like to ask is, what significance does it have? Does it justify what happened? Does it justify treating the Greek government as a dependency and the Greek people as lostrals and deputies? Does it establish anything that remotely looks like exceptionalism for Greece and Europe? And does it vindicate European economic policy in Greece? To explore that question, I think we need to examine the larger context of the story. First point is that Greece was not alone in responsibility for the irresponsibility that affected Greece directly. The European leadership knew that the books were being cooked. This information was not a secret at Eurostat. Goldman Sachs, a company not unknown to European financial governance at the highest levels, helped to cook the books. Kickbacks were no doubt taken, but they were also paid, and they weren't only paid by Greeks. The largest tax evader in Greece, I am told, according to an article in the London Review of Books by Terry Kelly, is a uh, company by the name of Hockti. It's a German construction company which happens to have the franchise for uh, running the Athens airport. Uh, so one could go down the list. This is the, the extension of loans from the uh, banks was in fact compensated by uh, interest rate differentials and it is the job of bankers to assess the risk uh, that they were taking something which they manifestly failed to just choose to do. Second point is that among mismanaged countries in Europe, Greece was certainly not alone. Ireland had an untrammeled commercial real estate boom, followed by catastrophic decisions in the mismanagement of the debt of the, uh, when, uh, the, uh, uh, when the thing came to a crashing end. In Spain, it was residential housing, it grew in an uncontrolled and uncontrolled way. In Portugal, probably the, probably the central thing is the overvaluation of the escudo and in entry into the Eurozone. And then we can begin to talk about Italy. Uh, and as you mentioned, Professor, I am a member of the Italian 
uh, Academia Nacional de Linche, and so for discretion's sake, I probably shouldn't uh, uh, get into chronicle the problems of Italian <laughs> management. But uh, let's just say that if I were to take it on as a serious proposition, we could be here all week. And then let's go on and talk about uh, a larger, let's say, structural question, which is the fundamental economic imbalance in Europe, which stems from the fact that certain regions, in fact, one country, in fact, this country, in fact, Germany, has, since the start of the euro, been running a large and growing current account surplus, which must, as an accounting matter, necessarily mean that her trading partners are in deficit and debt position. The reasons for that surplus are a combination of things. One of them is, no doubt, uh, the uh, cumulative and growing excellence and competitive advantage of German industry. Um, that is something which happens when you bring together a large uh, a geographic region into a continental economic union. There tends to be a concentration of advantage in the sectors and regions which are already ahead. Uh, that's called cumulative causation, and it is a natural process which not only affects industry, but also agriculture and services, and tends to uh, expand and increase the advantages of those who had a head start to begin with. And secondly, there was a policy decision, which was the wage austerity, uh, following the Hartz reforms that uh, tended to depress demand in Germany relative to what it otherwise would be. Put those two together, you have large surpluses. They must be recycled somehow, uh, and the European, uh, the European Monetary Union was designed in a way that that was being done uh, through credit mechanisms with the expectation that debts would be repaid. But debts are never repaid on that basis. Uh, and the recycling mechanism on that basis is destined to produce instability and crisis. So you have a deep flaw in the European uh, architecture which forces the recycling to run through the channel of both private and public debt rather than fiscal transfers uh, and other mechanisms uh, uh, that uh, social insurance, for example, uh, that uh, uh, can uh, permit uh, a regional balance to be recreated on a much more sustainable basis. And then finally, at the highest level, you have the larger architecture of neoliberal global finance, uh, by which the collapse uh, of, uh, in, uh, following essentially a, let's fair to say, criminal policy of deregulation, desupervision, and uh, decriminalization of the mortgage markets in the United States could be vectored into Europe uh, through the transmission of mortgage-backed securities, duly uh, rated triple uh, A by the uh, uh, by uh, ratings agencies who were paid in order to produce those ratings. The revenue model depended upon competitively giving uh, high ratings to manifestly fraudulent instruments backed by manifestly fraudulent representations and guarantees. Uh, and so on one hand, uh, a, uh, um, let's say, a global neoliberal architecture in which uh, the uh, transatlantic partner of the United States was deeply implicated. And when it collapsed, what happened? You got what was perfectly predictable and perfectly inevitable, a general flight to quality and to liquidity in the world capital market where quality is the security of the bonds of the, of the large states, of Germany, of France, of Britain, and of the United States, and liquidity is the money market in New York. So that is what happened, perfectly expect, expected, expectable, forecastable, but at whose expense? At the expense of risky assets of all types, including especially the sovereign bonds of countries uh, which are not uh, large and secure, including, of course, all of the crisis countries in Europe. And then there was the specific reaction of the creditors and the creditor institutions when the crisis broke in 2010 and decisions had to be taken about the larger financial system. 
We could begin, for example, uh, with Monsieur Jean-Claude Trichet, president at that time of the European Central Bank. One, what he did was to buy up Greek sovereign bonds, the securities market program, uh, from their private holders in order to support the price uh, of those bonds uh, and to reduce the losses uh, that private holders would have to incur relative to otherwise. He bought them at a significant discount of 30% and then insisted that they be serviced at full value uh, by the Greek government. We can proceed from Monsieur Trichet to another distinguished compatriot of his, uh, a man of impeccable reputation, as we have all uh, observed from subsequent experience, the then managing director of the International Monetary Fund, Monsieur Dominique Strauss-Kahn, uh, who brought the IMF into this program. And why did Monsieur Strauss-Kahn do that? There were two reasons, and I'm drawing here on the testimony of a former advisor to the then president of the European Commission, Jose Manuel Barroso, Philippe Le Grand, uh, to the Greek Parliamentary Commission, uh, which I happened to uh, attend uh, in probably in March of uh, this year. Uh, and the testimony was that the IMF came into this program for two reasons. One was that it was otherwise out of business. That is to say, the South American countries in particular, but also its other clients, had realized that the IMF prescriptions were dysfunctional, that they would be better off paying off the IMF, getting out of a program and conducting their affairs in their own way. And as such, if the IMF has no programs, it has no revenue and it has nothing to do. Uh, so from an institutional survival basis, it was necessary uh, to, uh, for the IMF uh, to uh, uh, join in. This is a factor that has nothing to do with Greece. And the second reason was, as everybody knows, that Monsieur Dominique Strauss-Kahn had presidential ambitions in the French Republic. Uh, and if you wish to become president of France, it is a very good idea to ingratiate yourself with the French bankers. Uh, and so the IMF made a loan to Greece of 32 times Greece's quota, the largest in history, for reasons that were not only, uh, let's say, something that you would prefer to conceal from the American taxpayers who were financing the IMF, but also had, frankly, nothing to do uh, with the economic conditions in Greece. And this was, by the way, against the advice of IMF staff and against the advice of certain IMF executive directors uh, who were well aware at the time uh, that the outcome would be uh, very uh, ugly. There were then uh, the governments of Europe, led by Germany and by France, who uh, took the step of transferring the Greek debt from the bankers to the taxpayers, right? and thereby converting what should have and could have been a commercial uh, restructuring uh, and write down on the spot uh, into a political problem uh, that engaged the credibility of the respective governments, uh, and thereby backed particularly those governments, including the one in this country, that have very long uh, tenure because of the political su success of the personalities involved, uh, into a position of, of, of having for a long period of time to pretend that they were making the right call uh, when it is clear to everybody that they were not. Uh, there was, of course, also the engagement of the government of the United States, which pressed the Europeans to do exactly this in order to avoid a credit event affecting uh, the uh, value of credit default swaps, derivatives held by the American banks, uh, and uh, which uh, might have engaged the United States Treasury in the last thing it wanted, which was to be involved in another rescue of the American financial system, uh, having just done one in 2008, 2009. And then finally, not to excuse one last class of individuals of whom I've already spoken, namely the professional economists, people with PhDs, well, there was this group of people who designed the reforms program for Greece, basically taking an off-the-shelf package of policies and imposing it on the country, blithely promising that the effect would be a 5% reduction in GDP on 2010-2011. It was obvious that it was going to be, have to be an adjustment or retrenchment. Uh, but they pr promised that it would be limited to 5% and that the recovery would start, start shortly and that it would be fully achieved by 2014. 
right? and we'll be back to the 2009 level of GDP. And in fact, uh, what happened in Greece was that the economy broke under the pressure of the program and the adjustment and the collapse of investment, and the GDP continued to decline until by 2014, it was fully 25% below, uh, and uh, no recovery in this. Uh, one might add that the economists had the temerity to say at that time that real GDP was growing in Greece when in fact what was happening was that nominal GDP was falling more rapidly. Uh, the prices were falling more rapidly than nominal GDP and so you were in a debt deflation of uh, uh, classical 1930s virulence. <clears throat> anyway, I suggest that the proposition here is the irrelevance of innocence and that claims of virtue, honesty, and competence ring hollow all around. Now, I'll make only one exception. Yeah. And that's an exception for the Greek public, uh, which had the common sense and a very considerable courage after four years of um, disastrous mistreatment at the hands of their own political elites and the professional uh, economics community and their creditors uh, to um, stand up and overturn their existing political order, banish the previously dominant political parties, and try something else. And that something else was not Golden Dawn. That something else was not the Nazi party that was rising in Greece in 2010, 2011. That something else was a progressive pro-European coalition with a coherent and articulated vision of what should be done, which was the accomplishment uh, of my friends, uh, Yanis Varoufakis and Alexis Tsipras. A coherent alternative not only for Greece, but also for Europe. Now what the European elements were, uh, they were not, uh, let's say, a formal part of the uh, electoral program of Syriza uh, in the fall of 2014, but they were close enough to be, uh, I think, familiar to people who were engaged in Greece at the time. Uh, they were basically the ideas of the modest proposal, which uh, Yanis had authored with the co-authorship of uh, Stuart Holland and eventually my collaboration on the final uh, uh, version. There were four elements here, uh, and that probably familiar to most of you. They were debt neutralization, through the European Central Bank using a mechanism that was clean and straightforward and that would not involve uh, higher interest uh, payments for the countries that were good credits, in other words, not diluting German credibility with the uh, creditworthiness uh, with uh, the, uh, that of their, of their less creditworthy partners. Uh, secondly, case-by-case -case resolution of the banks that were in uh, need of uh, resolution in order to break up the toxic connection between bankrupt banks and bankrupt states, which uh, clearly a, a problem that uh, uh, led to, lead to the freezing up of economic activity. An investment program to begin uh, the revitalization of the economies of the crisis region and running that through a competent professional agency that can already operate on a large scale, namely the European Investment Bank and the European Investment Fund. And then finally, what was my contribution uh, at the later stages of this, a solidarity program intended to provide a certain amount of support to the most vulnerable households directly through a European mechanism funded through the surpluses of the Target 2 system um, that would provide, for example, nutrition assistance or unemployment insurance, uh, at least initially, in such a way as to begin a little bit of stabilization of household incomes in the most vulnerable uh, sectors, but also to provide a little bit of kind of a direct good faith assurance to the most vulnerable people in Europe that the European Union had something for them directly. It didn't pass through their own distrusted and in many cases corrupt and inefficient governments. All of this was within the existing charters and treaties. It would not have required a federalist or a change in the charters or votes in European parliaments or by European polities who were obviously not at this point going to vote uh, for extending the uh, ambit of the European Union. Of course, this body of proposals did not get discussed at all uh, once the new government came to power in Greece and January. Not on the agenda. I think Giannis did present it once to the board of the European Investment Bank, but it was basically performed uh, in February 
What the government was required to do instead from the beginning uh, was to discuss under rather urgent, the pressure of urgent deadline, repayment deadlines, uh, the uh, terms of the memorandum of understanding that had been signed earlier. Uh, terms which had clearly proved to be dysfunctional and counterproductive in a number of important areas. Uh, I could go on for considerable length about the, um, uh, about the memorandum of understanding and its particular details that had been imposed on Greece, um, but I'll, I'll just restrict myself here to give you uh, the four major areas which were the most important so-called red lines of the Greek government when it attempted to uh, try to um, uh, uh, renegotiate the terms of the arrangement beginning uh, in, uh, with, the, with the agreement basically to provide four month window for negotiations that was occurred on the 20th of February. The first and the overarching a request or requirement was for a more reasonable fiscal program. What Greece had been required to commit to uh, in uh, the previous memorandum was an indefinite primary surplus target of 4.5% of GDP a target which has only been reached on a few occasions by a few countries and never under the extremely difficult circumstances that Greece faces. Uh, this was a target which was everybody recognized, both unrealistic and counterproductive, but it was also dishonest. And that was a very fundamental problem for this government, which had come in under the presupposition that it wasn't going to do dishonest things, at least not on a large scale. Uh, that the idea was that you Okay, we, they would accept a, a small primary surplus, which would already and still be a restricted macroeconomic program. They weren't asking to run a budget deficit that would have to be funded by the European partners, but not to run up a large financial surplus just for the sake of paying down a debt um, that could not in any event be repaid. And for which, once you got past the payment deadlines of 2015, was not itself the most pressing uh, problem. Uh, <coughs> Second point was the protection of the pensioners at the very lowest end of the payment spectrum in Greece. Uh, to give you an idea of what happened, uh, pension funds were wiped out in Greece in 2012 when the Greek debt was uh, restructured to a certain degree, very much to the disadvantage of those funds. Uh, pensions had already been reduced uh, by between 44 and 49 percent, basically across the board. The median pension in Greece was one euro above the poverty line, 664 versus 665 versus 664 euros a month. There are hundreds of thousands of pensioners in Greece, old and frail people, uh, getting by on 350 euro a month. And the memorandum proposed to cut that by 120 euro. And the government said, no, we're not going to do that. That that is inflicting harm on uh, the most vulnerable uh, and destitute people in the Greek population. Uh, third point was a point of, if you like, ideology and politics, but also of economics. It had to do with labor rights. Uh, the Greek uh, labor market had been deeply deregulated. It was and is the most, probably the most deregulated market in Europe these days. Uh, unions, which were never very strong, uh, have been largely um, eliminated. Collective bargaining basically didn't exist. Minimum wage had been cut. Uh, and the proposition of the Greek government was that this, the main effect of this was to force labor into the cash market, about 30% of labor had gone informal, uh, and therefore to deprive the Greek state of pension contributions. So it was dysfunctional from a fiscal standpoint, undermine the finances of the state. And that's a practical economic argument with, of course, the ideological and political component this government had the support of those trade unions that continued to exist in Greece. And it requested a trade union regime, a collective bargaining regime, that could be designed according to European standards and the standards of the International Labor Organization. That was the request, uh, the modification of the memorandum, instead of what I would call an unethical experiment in radical deregulation driven on ideological grounds. And the fourth point had to do with the management of privatizations. The government, being a left-wing government, was not a government that was particularly fond of privatization as a strategy, but it decided as a political matter that it would not oppose privatization. It would take an undogmatic approach, and it would uh, simply request that the privatization program be managed in a way 
that would do two things. One, bring in revenues to the state. Previous four years, privatizations had not done that. They brought in a pathetic amount of revenue, a half a billion euro a year, against a, a, a target of about 20. Uh, and uh, that they be done in such a way that the Greek state would remain, or have some upside exposure if the enterprises that were being privatized had uh, a uh, successful run, you know, capital airports, the port of Paris, and so forth. Uh, there were uh, some other things, uh, some very interesting things. Uh, the port of Piraeus is being privatized to the Chinese firm Costco, uh, and the Greek government insisted upon labor standards for the privatized entity. So you had uh, a, a left-wing government from a capitalist country imposing labor standards on a right-wing corporation from a communist country, which proves that we are truly in a postmodern uh, uh, economic management environment. So far as I'm aware, no one amongst the negotiating partners ever made, ever disputed in any sustained or coherent way, or for that matter, at all, the reasonableness of the Greek position. I certainly never heard a counter argument. On a few points, I think you could talk about the, the, the level of, of value added tax in the islands, you could have a discussion. And there were many points in the memorandum where the Greek government was in agreement with the uh, thrust of the memorandum. But on these points where there were differences, I don't think there was any claim that the Greek government's position was per se um, reasonable. Uh, there was also no willingness to make a good faith, good faith concessions on any of these points, and I'll come to that. Uh, and behind these issues, there was a fifth one, which was the longer run question of the sustainability of the Greek debt, where it was clear that the IMF believed and believes to this day that the Greek debt is not sustainable and therefore has to be renegotiated. Uh, and it can be done either by a write down, which would be a clean and, and, and direct way of doing it, or by some indefinite extension of the grace period. So that, for example, in one estimate, I saw the first payment for the Greek debt would occur uh, on my 101st birthday in 2053. Sufficiently far uh, into the future. Uh, <clears throat> okay, the reaction of the creditors over four months of these discussions, February to the end of June, unfolded on three separate levels. There was an institutional level at which the Greek teams, uh, headed ultimately by Euclid Sakalatos, who was the, is now the finance minister, uh, met with the representatives of the institutions, the ECB, the IMF, and the European Commission. I, I think it's fair to say now uh, that the representatives on the creditor side really did not have any authority to negotiate in any reasonable sense. Their job was not to sit down with the Greeks and work out a reasonable accommodation that would be uh, based upon what was best for the Greek economy. Their job was to implement the previous program and to monitor the compliance with the previous program uh, and to report upwards on whether the Greeks were making sufficient concessions. And what the Greeks would make a concession, they eventually made a fatal concession, concession on the first major issue, the primary surplus, which was, I think, in March. Uh, and, uh, and then they would, the creditors would pocket the concession and then move on to the next concession. It was not a game of negotiation where we give you something. And when they did make some modest concessions toward the end of the process, when we got to the very end, they pulled them all back. So they were right at the memorandum. Proving to us that, uh, that Minister Schreibel uh, was entirely correct in what he'd said from the beginning, that he could not give us anything except the memorandum or exit from the Eurozone. Now, our position was trying to attempt to circumvent that and to uh, but we couldn't know for sure whether that was a firm position or a bluff until we went through the process. Uh, anyway, there was a second level, which was the finance ministers, the so-called Eurogroup. A very curious body, I have to tell you. Uh, for someone who's worked in the U.S. Congress, the Eurogroup is just a, it's, there's no excuse for it. It wastes the time of finance ministers to an almost unbelievable degree. Uh, and uh, seriously, I mean, people are, are brought in from long distances for overnight meetings in order to argue through the wording of a few paragraphs of a press release. This is a, a farce as far as government is concerned, and there are also no minutes, and you can't be sure what actually went on at the meetings, and the, the, the reporting is entirely in control of the, uh, of, of the Brussels press uh, 
operation. But here, what actually happened was that local political considerations were not. So to the east, uh, in the Baltics, in Finland and Slovakia, you had governments which were ideologically committed to austerity and would not give any concession to any other country uh, because they were uh, convinced that what that they had applied the universally valid formula. And that was their position, and they weren't going to back off with it for the sake of a country a long way away, which did not have any voters in their own um, constituencies. Spain, Portugal, Ireland had a different problem. They had rising left-wing movements. They had Podemos, they had Livre, the Milwaukee Chair, they had Sinn Féin, and they were not going to make any concessions that might become political fodder in their own countries. So they were also also in a hard-line position, uh, and uh, uh, that also had nothing to do with Greece. France and Italy, uh, particularly France, had some sympathy for the Greek position, uh, but there was no political ca uh, uh, advantage in using political capital on behalf of the Greeks, and there was considerable hostility from the Socialist Party, uh, as was true of the SPD here, uh, against a party which had effectively obliterated the Socialist Party in Greece. So they were, um, although I think that's a, that probably not a fair criticism of the, of the French position. It was sympathetic, but it was just not effective. And then there was Germany's policy, which was set by Minister Schroeder. Uh, uh, I have to say, Minister Schäuble, whom I met here on the 8th of June, when I came up with Yanis Varoufakis, uh, was always very cordial, very professional, very direct, and uh, he basically uh, uh, told us what he would and would not do, and what he would do was nothing. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, I, one cannot fault him for any uh, evasiveness in this matter. Uh, and, uh, he gave us a choice, uh, which he knew would be a deeply unpalatable choice, uh, which was the choice of accepting the memorandum or taking Greece out of the euro, a proposition which the Greek government never had any intention of uh, doing, although, as I'll get to in a minute, they did prepare uh, for the contingency that they might be forced uh, to take that step. Uh, and then finally, at the highest level was what we call the political level, which was the direct government to government, uh, leader of government to leader of government level, Alexis Tsipras uh, to Chancellor Merkel, uh, where our hope was that we might be able persuade the German government as a whole, uh, under the leadership of Chancellor Merkel, to uh, uh, make uh, direct that some concessions and compromises be made in the larger interests of preserving democratic legitimacy and German leadership in Europe. Uh, and it was also our hope that uh, we might be able to get some friendly support for that position from the government of so other countries, in particular the United States, and I have to tell you I spent a good deal of time. Uh, talking to uh, people in my own government about that. Uh, I have friends that uh, my, my the Deputy Secretary of the Treasury, the highest ranking woman in the history of the Treasury Department, Sarah Raskin, uh, was on my staff at the Joint Economic Committee 30 years ago. So it was the things you do is keep people informed. Uh, that effort was, I think, the only reasonable and rational thing that the Greek government could attempt to do. It was, in fact, a coherent strategy. Uh, but it was against a, uh, a partner who, of course, is well known to play cards very close to the chest. Uh, and uh, we didn't know, and to be sure, until the end, or close to the end, whether we were going to get anything out of it. In the end, we did not. Meanwhile, as uh, the four months unfolded, uh, you had the role of the European Central Bank. The Central Bank's role. Uh, in a European, in a monetary union, in a monetary system, is fundamentally a fight to be the financial stabilizer, to be the force that keeps the financial system from falling apart. Uh, whatever Senor Draghi was and is able to do with respect to the Eurozone as a whole, with respect to Greece, the European Central Bank played the role of financial destabilizer. They played the role of increasing the anxiety of the Greek economic actors about the stability of their own banks. It did this on the 4th of February by revoking the waiver that permitted Greek banks to fund themselves directly at the ECB, and then by the force of the Greek banks to go to the emergency liquidity assistance, which was then raised bit by bit over week, week in and week out, reminding every week the Greek population that uh, they were, could, that, that, that the banks might be closed the following week. This is a formula for ceasing economic activity, uh, because capital controls could clearly be on their way to the coming. 
Uh, it was also, uh, over time, led to the withdrawal of the interbank lending supporting the Greek banking system. Uh, actually, the Greek depositors didn't move out that much, but the uh, foreign bank deposits in Greece left. Uh, meanwhile, over that time, the government drained its reserves in order to meet payments scheduled to the, uh, uh, to the IMF uh, and, the, and, uh, and uh, later in the summer to the European Central Bank. And mainly, it was the IMF payments that were problematic. Um, and uh, it, uh, it drained the hospitals, it drained the universities, it drained the municipalities, it drained its own uh, bank accounts until the point was in June uh, the Greek government was net low, several hundred million euro, coming up on payments of civil servants and pensions and so forth, and it was faced with a choice. Uh, was it going to uh, uh, default on those payments or default on its uh, obligations to the IMF, and there was a crisis at the early part of June, which a detail we don't need to get into, but uh, became clear that the drama was coming to a head. At the end of June, there was no money in the Greek coffers, the program uh, was expired, and the European Central Bank was in a position to uh, haircut the uh, value of the Greek government bonds, forcing uh, the, the country under capital controls. Uh, the capital controls, of course, led to the referendum, and the referendum uh, or vice versa, and you got the, uh, um, the, the, the two things occurred at the same time. The referendum led to a dramatic event, which again showed, in my view, the maturity uh, 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 and um, uh, courage of the Greek people uh, who uh, stood up to say, no, we're not going to be bullied and intimidated. Uh, and 61.5%, and every constituency in Greece, save one small one, the monastery on the Mount of Athos, voted no, uh, and, uh, but the government uh, was not prepared uh, or psychologically by that point uh, to, um, although it, it was more prepared than it might have been otherwise from a practical standpoint, it was not prepared psychologically uh, to uh, take the consequences of and the implications of the vote of the Greek people, and as you know what happened uh, was uh, the meeting of July 12th, 13th, uh, at which uh, eventually, uh, uh, the government capitulated, uh, and the memorandum was introduced in full force. What is now the case is that Greece is under a regime of liquidation and dispossession, uh, imposed in what is essentially a colonial fashion uh, on uh, a, uh, a uh, imposed from the outside in a, so it's essentially a neo-colonial fashion, uh, administered by the, by, enacted by the parliament and administered uh, by, the, um, uh, by the local administration. Uh, basically, there are 48 prior measures uh, that the parliament remains in, in the process of enacting uh, and put it into effect. What are these measures? Uh, fundamentally, they, of course, they raise taxes, they cut spending, uh, there's a new one coming through that will cut pensions. Uh, but fundamentally, it is about changing the, uh, uh, the dispossessing the state of its assets through a uh, large-scale privatization scheme, uh, dispossessing Greek businesses by accelerating the rate at which they go bankrupt, and dispossessing a large fraction of the Greek household sector through accelerated foreclosure processes. Uh, they're negotiating these, and there's a certain amount of give and take here. Uh, but that is the essence of what is going on. And you have a fundamental situation in which the Greek public is being uh, deprived of the ownership of the physical assets of its own country. Which raises, I think, a very interesting question for Europe as a whole. It's a question which would not be raised in the United States. Uh, there's a, but giving you, living in Texas gives you no right to own property, to own the property of Texas. Uh, but it is raised in the European context where you have a concrete notion of the separate and distinct uh, existence of individual country members of the European Union and the European uh, of the Eurozone. And that is what is being wiped out at this point in Greece, uh, progressively wiped out. Uh, and of course, uh, the people who live there who have a strong sense of their own identity don't like it. And they don't think that it is an appropriate uh, course of action. And so what you're going to get is, first of all, passive resistance. Uh, as I suppose the writs and so forth will be enforced not very uh, rapidly. 
Uh, and ultimately, and already, a certain amount of active resistance as you've had, I think, a couple of general strikes so far. And things have been placid, relatively speaking, in the first six months of this exercise, but I think it's unreasonable to expect that they will remain placid indefinitely, particularly as one goes through the winter. Uh, and the initial effect of the stabilization that occurred because the banking system wasn't allowed to collapse completely uh, begins to be overtaken by the effect of spending uh, pension cuts and other spending cuts on the one side and tax increases on the other. Uh, so there you are. Uh, it was part of, I think, the idea of some part of the European leadership that this, uh, uh, making an example of Greece, uh, making it clear that there could not be a left government anywhere in Europe under the present dispensation, uh, will of the voters uh, to the contrary notwithstanding. Uh, that would intimidate the voters in other parts of Europe. It is clear that that did not succeed in intimidating the voters of Portugal, uh, who have now, uh, to considerable surprise, uh, of a number of people, uh, created a, a, a coalition of the Socialist Party and the Blokist area and the Portuguese Communist Party for the first time actually bringing those units together since the revolution. Uh, so we will see. I don't know. The people, my, my friends on the left are not necessarily terribly optimistic. We'll find out what happened happen in uh, a few days in Spain and, uh, and um, there will be Ireland will come around eventually and we'll see what ultimately will happen in Italy. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that the, this game is not over uh, that uh, while I have I retain the greatest respect actually uh, for uh, the German government as the one force in Europe that has the capacity uh, to um, uh, to set the course of Europe, uh, that I think the decision to uh, effectively try to destroy uh, the Syriza government in Greece in July, um, as George Papadreou had been destroyed and as Berlusconi was destroyed, was a uh, long-term strategic mistake because it has tended to devalue uh, the, uh, the concept of democratic legitimacy in Europe. Uh, the Greek people, again, reacted quite maturely to that by uh, returning the same coalition to power uh, in September. Uh, and the consequences of that will, will, will play out over time. Uh, as to what needs to happen now, I think uh, from the standpoint of any one country, uh, the clear lesson of the Syriza experience is that you will not get concessions in uh, unilateral negotiations unless you have leverage uh, that can get those concessions. Uh, if you're Portugal, Spain, Ireland, or Italy, and you're not under a memorandum, you have more leverage than Greece did. Uh, but the second piece of, of leverage that countries will have, particularly now that the technical questions, have, the technical issues have been worked out, is the possibility of a plan B. The plan B in Greece was a secret. It was a very tightly kept secret amongst five people. In the uh, who allied with the with the Ministry of Finance, none of them Greeks, none of them employees of the Ministry of Finance. The coordinator of that effort was me, uh, and uh, it was done in such a way that its existence was not disclosed until after the end of the Varoufakis ministry. The next time, whether this is in some other country or less likely in Greece, uh, that this issue comes up, I do not think. Uh, that the effort will need to be kept secret. It will, in fact, become a routine part of the planning of any finance ministry uh, that is uh, a, cop a negotiating problem that it has to deal with. And, um, and so it will be just simply straightforward that we have an office over here which is working out the contingency in case you push us to the wall. Um, so given that, uh, what is the hope? The hope is that there could be a coalition across European countries to come up with a new dispensation that is more functional for the whole of Europe, that does not treat the countries of, uh, of, the, uh, of the periphery as though they were more responsible for the crisis than the countries of the center, uh, that respects the requirement that there be a certain level of prosperity and stability across all of Europe, uh, and that uh, um, in some sense treats the, uh, the, the governments that may come into play as, a, uh, as, as proper negotiating partners rather than as delinquents and dependents. If that could be done, then there might be a future for, for, the, uh, uh, for the European Union. 
might involve modifying the structure of the Eurozone, the future for the European Union. If it can't be done, I think the economic problems will play into the tensions of the, that are currently stressing the European Union going forward, and that is going to be something that we'll all be living with for a long time to come. Thanks very much. Thank you.